find our place of service. For us to find our place of service. What does that mean? It means that God has given you each talent and abilities and gifts. And he expects you to use them for him. And not only that, he expects you to use them to serve one another. Especially those in the household of God, in the church. You're supposed to serve one another. Notice what it says in 1 Peter 4.10. Let's read this one out loud together. Uh, let's read it out loud. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. You know what? Not all of you are called to be a pastor. Amen, right? <laughs> Not all of you are called to be a Sunday school teacher. Thank you, Lord. Right? Not all of you are called to work with youth or children or young adults, but you are all called to do something. Somebody once said, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm a toenail on the body of Christ. If you've ever lost a toenail, you know how important that is. How much pain it is to, have, to not have one and something falls on your foot. Right? Now, um, just, just hear me, guys. Uh, God desires for us to serve one another. And if you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to be maturing, you're growing in your understanding of what God wants, you cannot ignore this principle. But sadly enough, look at confession number four. Some Christians prefer serve us to service. Some Christians prefer serve us to service. I've been thinking about our community, and I've been thinking about how many people live in this area? And it just blows me away that within 10 miles, there's about 1.8 million people around us. And I just got to be honest, most of those people don't know Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking, you can take every church in all of Orange County and fill them up. Maybe even several times a day. Maybe two or three services a day. You can take all of the churches and fill them up uh, 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 several times a day. And we still would be reaching all the people that need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I think about this and I think, you know what? God has called all of us to be the body of Christ and to go out and reach other people. Now, it's not about you and me. Uh, if it was about me, you and me, Jesus would have killed you and taken you home the moment you accepted Christ into your life. But he didn't. He left you here so that you can reach out to others and serve one another. Now, notice this. Some Christians prefer serve us. You know, it's all about me and what I can get and what, what that church has to offer me as to, uh, rather than what can I do to minister to the, to the people where God has called me to be. Look at, look at number five. It has always been God's desire for the church for us to share our faith. It has always been God's desire from day one to share our faith. Jesus went around sharing his faith. He went around inviting people into the kingdom of God. And then when he left and he went up into heaven, you remember that in Acts chapter 1, as his disciples were standing there watching him go to heaven, before he went, he says, look, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to give me the power to be my witnesses into all of the world. And yet, uh, there seems to be a disconnect there. Notice this passage is great commission. Let's read this out loud. Now notice, this is not the great, uh, the great if you want to do this. Type thing, you know. It's not it's not the great option for us. It's the great commission for every Christian. This is our marching orders as followers of Christ. Let's read it out loud, okay? Let's read it with some great enthusiasm this morning. You ready? Mm -hmm. It says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What does God want us to do? Go make disciples. Of who? People who aren't disciples. And then what does he want us to do? Baptize them. Now guys, if you're a follower of Christ and, and, and you haven't been baptized yet, uh, an older pastor.
pastor this week, I was kind of talking to him about this, this concept of people who give their life to Christ and then they don't get baptized. This older guy who's been in the ministry for 60 years just flat out told me that's an obedience issue. Not a baptism issue. It's an obedience issue. You're either going to do what God wants you to do or you're not. And then he says, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to, to do what? Circle that word, to obey. To obey everything I've commanded you. Does that mean to teach them to love God? Absolutely. Does that mean to teach them to love one another? Absolutely. Does that mean teach them to grow in their faith? Absolutely. Does that mean teach you that you got to be involved in service in order to honor God? Absolutely. Does that mean that you have to learn how to share your faith? Yeah, it does. And it's not the pastor's responsibility, and it's not the deacon's responsibility. It's not a select few's responsibility. It's all of our responsibility to share our faith. But sadly, the confession number five is this. Some Christians never share their faith. And I just want you to be totally honest with yourself today. And nobody's going to look at you weird or anything like that. Just be totally honest. In 2009, how many people did you share your faith with? And tell them about Jesus, that they could be forgiven of their sins, that they could have a home in heaven, that God has a purpose for their life. Just be real honest. And then ask yourself, is that the way you're going to be this year? Or in the next 10 years? You know, we start into the new decade this, uh, this month. And we're doing some things that are new. And I just want to say, is that the way we're going to be in 2010 and on? Some Christians never share their faith. Well, notice what I wrote on your outline. We can't just be some Christians. You know, you can't just be some average Christian. If you want to be that average Christian, let me just say you're missing out on the obedience love that God has prepared for us. We can't just be some Christians. God wants, notice what it says on your outline, mature Christians. Ten years from now, I, want, I would love if they would go back to those same group of people under 30 years old. And, and instead of what they said, I wish that they would say things like this. You know, these, these people are there for you. When everybody else walks out, evangelicals are there for you. I wish that people would say, you know, that's the kind of people that give each other a second chance. And when, when they come in and they're broken and they're beat up and they're hurting, man, those are the people that offer hope. And, and, you know, they stand for truth, but they don't beat you over the head with it. They share it in a loving way. You remember how I said that the message never changes, but the methods always change. And, and so we've got to figure out a way to share the truth. In a way that when they see us sharing the truth, they know we're doing it out of a motivation of love. Uh, I'd like them to say that, that evangelicals are kind and generous. They act like Jesus. They, fit, they feed the, the hungry. They're there for the poor. They're there for the sick. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the way I would like people to look at the church. But you know what? It starts with you and it starts with me. And they're not going to look at, any, at us any differently unless we act a little bit differently in the way that God wants us to. Now notice this. I give, I'm going to give you five ideas in which to kind of implement this in your head. And so get you thinking about it. Uh, number one is this. How do I love and trust God? Uh, the answer to this is this. And write it down one day at a time. I left a blank space under outline for you to write it down. How do you and I love and trust God? We do it one day at a time. And every morning when you wake up, you have an opportunity to say, God, it's a new day. I'm going to do something different to live for you and show you how much I love you. I love this passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing him. This is true worship that you should offer. If you want to worship God, you offer yourself on a daily basis. God, I want to love you a little bit more than I did yesterday. Lord, you know, I wasn't too kind with my words yesterday. 
to those I love the most, but God, today, help me to be different. And you take a daily step to do that. Now, uh, one of the ways that we do this, some other ways, we spend time with Him. We, we, when we're making decisions about what to do in life, we say, God, what is it that you want me to do, God? You know, we advise, we ask God's opinion. And if he tells us something different than what we want to do, we do what God wants us to do. 